Hi everyone, it's Simon Khaled here from Science of the Times. Just about to head over for lunch and I've spotted my colleague, Professor David Pyle. David is a world-renowned volcanologist and has recently also become a fellow of the Royal Society. Given the recent excitement we had at Mount Etna, I thought it'd be good to see if I can try and persuade him to do a five-minute explainer on volcanic eruptions. Keep your fingers crossed, he says yes. Thank you, David. Pleasure. So, has it, been a bit, has it been exciting in the world of volcanoes in the last few days? So Etna is definitely in, in a phase of enhanced activity. It's, I think there's two things to say. One is it's a very big mountain. It's about three and a half thousand metres high. So it's actually it's a proper sized volcano. Um, and it is very well monitored. So the, the Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology the Italian, our Italian colleagues have it well monitored from satellite, from ground, uh, videos with webcams and, and so on. Um, so Etna has been in an enhanced state of activity certainly over so the last... So was this expected, the eruption? So in fact this particular eruption was not expected. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the background I suppose is that, that, that the summit of Etna has a complex of three or four craters. Mm -hmm summit crater complex and one of those craters is called the southeast crater and and then the others have different names and and they grow and change shape dramatically okay. on time scales of years to decades right. so the kind of the morphology of the of the summit today is very different from what it was three or four years ago oh well wow. so the, the by morphology you mean the outer shape actually, right so outer how shape, it what like? we can actually wow. see so what's happened over the last couple of years is that Etna has had some of its characteristic um, bursts of activity, which yes. are called paroxysms. Right. And often with a paroxysm, there are signs of that are kind of magnets moving, maybe, maybe a bit of deformation that they can right. see with satellites. Sometimes you can see precursor leaks of gas. Um, but often it's the seismicity, the kind of the, the tiny earthquakes that you wouldn't feel, but the instruments can detect. So it's been in this kind of spasmodic activity, and a paroxysm might be where it suddenly has fire fountains right. that last for a few hours. Right. And in the really big fire fountains, you can, you can get volcanic ash, which might then be blown by the wind out over Catania or some of the you know, nearby, right. nearby settlements or the, the larger towns and cities further away. Wow. So the... I suppose the key, key thing about this style of activity is that during the Strombolian activity, you build up what we'd call a cinder cone. Right. So that's a kind of a rampart of so debris. This eruption is a Strombolian eruption, and that's there's lots right. of different types of eruptions. That's exactly. Right. So Stromboli, Strombolian, the name comes from Stromboli, and it's, yes. it's the classic red style of eruption. If you see a, a film footage with a kind of a conical vent. Right. And... Um, streams of red hot material going up and then some billowing ash clouds. It looks quite nice and spectacular. Very spectacular. Right. So the, the activity at the moment is in the region called the Southeast Crater. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years ago, the Southeast Crater had quite a dramatic stage of activity where it, it grew. And as it was growing, it's basically growing too fast. And then there were parts of the crater were gravitationally unstable. And so in between eruptions... Yeah you'd have landslides inside the crater and puffs of um, reddish to brownish ash. Right. So what happened, um, I think was it yesterday morning, anyway, a couple of days ago, Monday, was that the, the, the Institute knew that the seismicity was, was increasing, right. uh, so they were expecting another Strombolian phase within yes. the next couple of days. And then it began very dramatically with what was probably a landslide and a, and a collapse of a part of the southeast right, cone. Right. And basically when you have hot rock and a landslide, it's, it starts as a rock avalanche, right. but in fact the material becomes fragmented. Yes. And you then have this really dramatic, um, geologists call it a pyroclastic density current. It's basically a form of gravity current where this granular material, which is hot, yeah. uh, races down the side of the volcano um, for some hundreds of metres. Right. And then as, as it runs over the bumpy surface or entrains cold air, 
the air is heated, and you get these turbulent and buoyant plumes of ash rising above them. Right. Wow. And so, do the so erupts and stuff comes out? Does that have some any kind of detrimental effect on the local environment? So that's really it's a really interesting question because, of course, the the entire landscape is dominated by the volcanic activity, yeah. and so in a way you have you have a really harsh environment. The top couple of thousand meters of Etna, um, most of the land surface is lava that's less than 100 years old or right. granular, ground up volcanic ash. We call it kind of scoria, bits of bits of rock debris yeah. that have been deposited in the last few decades. And of course, there's this ice and snow deposits. Sure. So like, there's nothing, I guess, grow there or anything like that, I guess, right? Not much. That. There are there are lichen that are clinging on in some places. Right. Um, local places, you get little bits of vegetation which can just, just about hold on. So further down the slopes, you get Etna broom and you get kind of... Etna broom, what's Etna. that? So broom is the, it's kind of a, Biologists, isn't it? Like it's, it's, it's one <laughs> Don't of worry, these... we won't tell the biologists. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, it's a it's a woody shrub, right? right. And it it's often has bright yellow flowers in right, the right. summer. And in the UK, you can see it in in scrubland. Um, sure. Um, okay, I see. So, so okay, so it's just, so it's the name of the of the, of the plant that grows near. Yes. Uh, okay. And um, yeah, so the whole the whole summit environment is really harsh, and you. What was gratifying, um, so there are obviously some photos of tourists yes. who are <laughs> doing a combination of watching this ash cloud, filming it and running backwards. But it was quite good that they all seem to be wearing hard hats, right. uh, which is very and good. I guess if there was no warning for this particular one, then they wouldn't have been expecting this. That's right. So I think so... that the, the uh, as I say, Etna is such a large mountain that it's mandatory, I understand it's mandatory to, to hike with guides. Yes, of course. And obviously the guides are very experienced and they'll just make judgment calls. But in fact, when you get very high up and depending on the wind, the acid fumes from the steaming vents can yes. be really, really challenging. Yes, I bet, I bet. Well, thank you, David. That's, that's absolutely fascinating okay. and uh, timely. So you know what I'm going to ask you next. You, you've explained to us about Etna and it's been really interesting. Will you agree to come on a full podcast with us and tell us more about your own work? Uh, yes, certainly, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Really look forward to that. So thanks again for the explainer today. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely tap you up for a, a full podcast episode. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, folks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye.